Hey there, students, and welcome to part three of the um, integration algebra regions exam for June 2013. Uh, in this installment, we're going to be going over questions 11 through 15. All right, let's take a look at question 11. It says uh, the solutions of x squared minus x squared equals 16x minus 28 are. Now, there are two ways we can uh, solve this problem. Uh, first method, we can plug in the solutions and see which one creates a true statement. And the second method is by uh, factoring, factoring this quadratic equation we have here after putting it in standard form. Okay, so I'm going to go ahead and show you both methods. Uh, method one, method one, uh, method one, we're going to just plug and, plug and check, plug and check. Some people call it plug and chug. So we're going to plug and check. Uh, if you have a calculator, um, that, this could be really handy. Uh, you can just plug it into your calculator and compute uh, the expressions real quickly, okay? So first um, option we're going to test, uh, we're going to test um, option number one. Let me do it down here. Uh, option number one. Option one, we have solutions. The solutions are negative two and negative 14. Um, we're going to be plugging it into the equation, this is the test equation right here, x squared equals 16x minus 28. So let's test the first one. The one we're going to test first is x equals negative 2. Now, both answers must satisfy the equation in order for that to be a solution. If one fails, the second doesn't count anymore. Okay, so let's test uh, uh, negative 2. So we'll plug it in here. The question is, is negative 2 squared equals 16 times negative 2 minus 28. Is that true or false? That's the question. Okay. So if I square this, I get 4 because negative times negative is positive. And multiply this together, I get negative 32 minus 28. And a, the question is 4 equals um, negative 60. The answer is no. So this uh, is wrong. So since this is wrong, that automatically tells me that option 1 is not a solution. All right. So we're going to shift to um, option number 2. And we're going to test uh, 2 and 14. Okay, 2 and 14. Let me partition my workspace so we don't get confused. All right, so we're going to test both of them into the same function. Uh, so let's see. Um, the question is, is, um, let's scroll this up a little bit so I can see the function. Okay, there you go. All right, so it is 2 squared equals 16 times 2 minus 28. Is that true or false? 2 squared is 4. Is 4 equals 16 times 2 is 32 minus 28. Uh, six, 32 minus 28 is 4. Is 4 equal 4? Absolutely. So this checks. All right. Um, we just tested uh, x equals 2. Now what do we do next? We have to test the second one. Um, x equals uh, 14 to see if it's true. So we'll plug it into the function also. So the question is, is uh, 14 square equals 16 times 14 minus 28? Okay, 14 square is 196. Uh, 16 times 14, you can do this with your calculator, 224 minus 28. And uh, if you subtract these two, you get 196. So 196 is equal to 196, that checks out. So that tells me that our correct answer is option uh, option number two, okay? Option number two is our correct answer here. All right, so we just did method one, which is plug and check. Now let's do method two, which involves factorization, okay? Any method you like will, will work here, as long as our results are, um, are integers, okay? Um, our rational numbers. If we have irrational results, then uh, factorization will not will not suffice. All right. So method two uh, is factorization. Get to uh, make use of your factoring skills here. All right. So before we uh, proceed with factorization of x square equals sixteen x minus twenty eight, we have to put it in standard form or make it equal to zero. Okay. So to accomplish that, uh, we'll subtract 16x from both sides and add 28. 16x, because when we put it in standard form, we can make use of the zero product property after factoring it, okay? So we're going to have x squared minus 16x plus 28 equals zero, okay? 
All right, now let's see. We have it in standard form. Can we reduce? Is there a common factor we can factor out? There isn't any common factor. So let's go ahead and factor this, okay? All right, we're gonna, I'm going to make use of the X scheme. I like to use the X scheme to factor quadratic trinomials of this nature. Uh, AC goes on top. V goes on the bottom. This is ABC. So AC is positive 28 and V is negative 16. So what's the number is multiply to give you 28 and add to give you 16? That's the question. Okay, so let's make our factor tree, um, our chart of um, factors here. What pairs of integers are multiplied to give you 28? I know 1 times 28 is 28. This combination yields 29 and 27. That doesn't work because we're looking for 16. 2 times 14 is another pair. 2 plus 14 is 16, 2 minus 14 is uh, 12. So this pair is excellent. This is the pair I need right here. Okay, so I'm going to put 2 and 14. Now let's resolve the signs and see if it works. Since the product is positive and the sum is negative, that means both of, both of them must be negative, all right? So I'm going to put that in here, x squared minus 2x minus 14x plus 28 equals 0. We're going to break it down the center and factor by grouping, okay? All right. Now, uh, from the first two, I can take out an x. x minus 2 is what you have left. And from these, so I can take out negative 14. I end up with x minus 2. And then you have x minus 2 and x minus 14, okay? Now, when some, some people get to this step of factoring, they say, oh, the roots are negative 2 and 14, and guess what? They go ahead and select option number uh, 1, negative 2 and negative 14. That's inaccurate, okay, because you have to do some more work. You have to apply the zero product property, okay? So how you do that is you set x minus 2 to 0 and x minus 14 to 0, and then you solve. If I solve this, I'll have x equals 2, and I solve this, I'll have x equals 14, okay? So your solutions are positive 2 and 14, as we uh, got in our other other method of um, when we use the plug and check method, all right? So we can clearly see that our answer is option 2. All right, let's move on. All right, let's take a look at our question number 12. Our, um, question 12 says, if the expression 2y to the a to the fourth power is equivalent to 16y to the eighth, what is the value of a? So we have an equation that we have to solve, 2y the a raised to the fourth power <coughs> equals 16y to the eighth. All right, so we want to solve for a, okay? So first thing we're going to do, we're going to simplify or expand the left side as much as we can. We're going to use the product of, um, the power of a product of powers property here, which basically means that you have to distribute, requires you to distribute the power to the um, product of powers here. Two is a power to the first power, that's why it's just two. So what we're going to do is basically multiply this power by these powers here, okay? So you're going to have uh, 2 to the 4th, y to the 4 times a, which is 4a. Remember to always multiply the powers, okay? Equals 16y to the 8th. Now 2 to the 4th is uh, 4 times 4, which is 16. So we have 16y to the 4a equals 16y to the 8th. You notice that it's, they have two 16s here, so we can divide by 16 and drop the y's too. So since the base is a base is equal, so let's let's divide by 16 first, so you can clearly see what I'm doing here. Divide by 16. You have to be careful here. So we're gonna have uh, y to the 4a. Y to the 4a equals y to the 8. Okay, now since the bases are equal, we can take log base y, but no, I don't want to do logarithms here. But I can just simply drop the y's because uh, they're both the same. So we focus on the powers. Okay, we know that 4a has to be equal to 8 since y is equal to y. So 4a equals 8, this basically means what do you multiply by 4 to get 8? The answer is 2. We can clearly see the answer is 2. So just to show the work, divide by 4, both sides, and you get your final answer. Uh, a equals 2. So that's what satisfies A in order to get 61 to the fourth after expanding this. So our answer is option number two. Okay? All right, let's shift our attention to number 13. Um, so number 13 says, which shows bivariate data? Okay, so uh, this is just a test of your knowledge of vocabulary here. Bivariate data is basically two data, um, 
collection of data sets that are related, okay? One of the data sets must be dependent on the other, okay? So bivariate, if you think about bivariate, think about uh, connected or dependent or dependent, dependent, okay? Sets. So one must be dependent on the other or they have to be connected somehow and the connection has to be logical or explicit. If there is any confusion as to the connectedness of the data set, more likely than not, it's going to be univariate, okay? So univariate, you're going to have two independent data sets, but by variate, you're going to have a dependent and a dependent um, sets there, okay? Dependent and independent, independent. All right, so the goal here is we want to look at the data sets we have and see if we can establish a, a logical connection of one measure being dependent on the other, okay? It could be dependent, independent, or independent, dependent. It doesn't really matter the order. So let's look at this, age and frequency, 14, 15, 16, 17, and we have frequency here. Does the age, let's say in the school, for example, tell you how many of a certain, how many numbers of a certain students they are? Can we establish a direct link here? Uh, the answer is no, the connection is cloudy. There isn't a direct connection between the number, uh, between a person's age and a number of people of that age in a certain group. Okay, it's it's not direct. You have to you need more more information. So how could this is univariate right here? This is univariate. How can we make this bivariate? How can we do that? Well, if we want to make this bivariate, how about we change frequency to let's say height? What if we do for height? Will it be bivariate? Absolutely, because you know the older you get, more likely than not, the taller the height, the taller you can, the higher the taller you can be. Okay, so that's one way um, of, of doing it, or maybe age and um, maturity, age and uh, shoe size, age and height. I already said that, you know, so something that's some kind of explicit connection, then that works. Okay, so this one the connection is there isn't any direct connection here, two independent variables. So this is univariate. We need the one that's bivariate. Okay, all right, let's shift our attention to number two type of car. In average gas mileage, miles per gallon type of car. Okay, do we see a direct connection here? The answer is absolutely not. Okay, because the type of car does automatically tell you um, what the gas mileage is. Um, a van, what kind of van is it? Is it a three? Is it a fifteen passenger van, a six passenger van, or is it a van, a really large van? Does the van run on? Um, Electricity is it, is it an electric powered van? Is it a hybrid van? That will impact the, the my gas mileage. So uh, there isn't a direct connection here. Or the SUV, for example, what kind of SUV is it? Is it a Hummer SUV or what kind of SUV? Um, so that the, the, the just telling you the type of the car of car does not automatically tell you of uh, the gas mileage. There isn't a direct connection. It's a, kind of a weak type of connection, but it's not direct. All right. How, so this one right here is univariate. Okay, because they're independent, they're two independent uh, data sets. How can we make this bivariate? What if type of car was switched into size of engine? Okay, you know that the bigger the engine, guess what? The lower the gas mileage, because bigger engines use more gasoline. Okay, so let's say it was a 1.5 liter engine. It's going to make very little uh, use of gas. It's a small engine, so it takes small gas. What if it were a 3.7 liter? How about a a um, a 5.0 like a Mustang V8? So the bigger the size of the engine, the more gas is going to use. Okay, because bigger engines are known as gas goggles. So that's one way to make it bivariate. Okay, but just telling you the type of car that doesn't tell you is not directly connected with uh, gas mileage. Okay, so these two are independent of each other. All right, let's shift our attention to option three. Time spent studying and test grade, are they connected? Well, there is a reasonable connection here because guess what? The more time you spend studying, what do, happens with your grade? Your grade goes higher, okay? Regardless of how intelligent you are, um, the more time you spend studying, the more of the material you can assume, um, assimilating your mind, hence increasing your test grade. So this one is in fact bivariate because it's connected, all right? Study more, your grades will go up, all right? So this makes perfect sense. All right, let's shift to the next one, the last one. 
the day and temperature. Our Monday is always 63 degrees. Our Monday is always hot on Tuesdays. Our Tuesday is always cooler than Mondays. Does a day tell you the temperature of the day? Absolutely not. Okay, so this one is univariate. All right, how do we make this bivariate? What if we talk about countries, for example, because if you're living in the poles, let's say you're living in Alaska, you expect it to have cold, lower temperatures. And if you're living in the, in the equatorial regions, like in um, Hawaii or um, in Sudan, um, in the desert, you expect it to have higher temperatures, okay? So temperature is dependent on the different locations on the globe. It is not dependent on the day of the month. I'm, I'm sorry, the day of the week. <laughs> So um, this is clearly univariate because they're not directly connected, all right? So our answer is option letter number three, all right? So there you have it. All right, let's take a look at question 14. We have a box, box and whisker plot here um, of a test score in a, math, of, um, in a math class. So the question says, what does 65, 85, and 100 represent, okay? So let's identify where those are. This right here, this point, this is uh, 65, and this is 85, and this point right here is 100. Okay, so what are these? Now let's label what this uh, respective portions are of a box and whisker plot. This line right here is known as your maximum. Okay, it's known as your maximum. This line right here is known as your minimum. Okay. Minimum. All right, these three lines here are your quartiles. Okay, so this first piece is uh, Q1, also known as Q1, also known as your uh, uh, lower quartile. Lower quartile. Lower quartile. It's Q1. And then this one right here is known as Q2. Your Q2 is also your median. Okay. Keep that in mind. And then this line right here, this last line right here, we're talking about those lines, okay? This line right here, this line right here. Okay, and then this line right here, that is Q3 or your upper quartile, okay? Upper quartile. And then you're gonna find your interquartile range, you just subtract that Q3 from Q1, you're gonna find your range, you subtract the minimum from the maximum, all that cool stuff. Anyway, but we are asked to focus on 65, 85, and 100. So 65 corresponds to our lower quartile. So this is 65 right here. 85 corresponds to Q3 or our upper quartile. And 100 corresponds to our maximum. All right, so these numbers represent Q1, Q3, and the maximum. Option number two is our answer. All right, so there you have it. All right, let's shift our attention to question 15. Uh, 15 says the expression x minus 3 um, over x plus 2 is defined uh, when the value of x is. Now, um, what makes an expression undefined? An expression is undefined when you divide by 0. Okay, don't forget that. Um, undefined involves dividing by 0. Okay, undefined. Gosh, I can't spell undefined for some reason. Um, Undefined, undefined, happens when the denominator is equal to zero. So any value of x that makes the denominator equal to zero will make the expression undefined because any number divided by zero is undefined. Okay, so number divided by zero equals undefined. Okay, so we have a rational expression here. We set just the denominator to zero. Okay. And then what value of x to make this equal to 0? So that for x, subtract 2 from both sides. We have x equals negative 2, and that goes your final answer. If x is negative 2, you're going to have an undefined a value for this entire expression. Negative 3 is a, is, a, is a root or a 0 of this expression. We don't want that, okay? So negative 2 only tells us when this expression is undefined, okay? So there you have it. Well, thanks so much for taking the time to watch this presentation. Feel free to subscribe to my channel by clicking up here. And please post a comment to let me know what you think about this tutorial. Uh, more clips can be found on mybgoodstore.com. Thanks again for watching and have a wonderful day.